Hello, welcome to Studio One. If you like what you see, like and subscribe and comment. Thank you for being on. Well, thank you for having me. I, uh, I have recently grown to love Toronto and Canada in general, even though I'm not from there, just because I collaborated with some, I collaborated with these guys, Loud Luxury, who are, who are very well loved there. Yeah, I had the pleasure of interviewing them a while, I think a year or two ago. So yeah, they're, Wait, they're, no yeah, they're really good yeah. people. Yeah, and their fans are so awesome. I've, they've just been so nice to me, and I'm like, oh my god, the Canadians are so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, before we really start to begin, can you briefly just introduce yourself, and then we'll get started. Yeah, of course. Um, my name is Morgan St. Jean. I am born and raised in Los Angeles, which people find very crazy. But yes, I am born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm a pop artist and a songwriter, and yeah. Cool. Um before we start talking about music, I think it's important, you know, to ask, how have you been doing with quarantine and COVID and how's LA been with all that? It's been pretty crazy. LA is not doing great, but you know, I'm doing all right. I feel very lucky. I've been able to be with my family and my parents actually let me turn our basement at their house into a studio. So I have a nice little work from home space and, you know, I've been getting some nice quality time with my family, so it could be worse. Cool. That sounds great. Uh, yeah. Toronto, it's not, it used to be kind of good. I think during yeah. Thanksgiving, it kind of like went up again and we're, we're, oh, yeah, really? we're on our own new lockdown too. So How <laughs> we're are you doing? yeah, we're trying, we're trying to, yeah. but yeah, uh, going on to music, um, talk to me about like when you were younger. Cause I know there's like key moments where, uh, that you started having this like belief in yourself that you can be a musician a lot of the times when you're in school there's key people that kind of let you know it was possible talk about that yeah so for me the first key person was a choir director named Mr. Nove shout out to Mr. Nove um and when I was in I would say the second grade I auditioned for the school choir I went to Catholic school briefly and so music was kind of a big thing there yeah. and up until that point I was probably what like nine ten at that age and um up until that point I had sang a lot of karaoke in my bedroom my godparents bought me a karaoke machine one year and I would sing you know Christina Aguilera yeah. and Britney Spears and the Spice Girls and everything and but you know I really started to take it more seriously when I auditioned for this choir in school and I was accepted into the choir and then a couple weeks into rehearsals, my director asked me if my mom was going to be picking me up that day. So I was horrified. I thought I was going to get kicked out. I didn't yeah. understand why. And he ended up telling my mom that he thought I had some potential and she was very confused. He was like, does your daughter sing a lot? And my mom was like, she sings Britney Spears karaoke. Yeah. Like, that's it. <laughs> so um, I ended up, he ended up being my first kind of vocal teacher who taught me, the, you know, the basics of singing. And I was the featured soloist of that group. Um, and then from there, I started writing songs. My parents bought me this little songwriting journal when I was a kid for Christmas. And, and you know, throughout that time, I started to figure out, you know, I liked pop music and I was singing in choirs and I was doing musical theater because that was the way that I could sing when I was in school. Yeah. But I very quickly started to realize that I liked writing songs and that I liked singing pop music. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because a lot of people can tell you, you know, you're talented. I think you have it in you. At what point did you start? believing that you had the talent? Like, when did you start believing in yourself that you had it? Because a lot of people can tell you, I think you have a really good voice. When did you start believing in yourself? I think it's interesting because especially being from Los Angeles, like a lot of people want to go into entertainment. And I think the city and the people in this city are a little bit jaded. So, you know, I had a lot of friends whose parents were in entertainment and they would say like, don't do it. Yeah. You can avoid it. Please God, don't do it. So I don't ever feel like I really had that like false sense of hope it was it was much more realistic for me um early on but i always had this fear that i was like one of those people who you know my parents thought i was good and then i would go on american idol or something and everyone in the world would be like what like what <laughs> yeah. were you thinking telling you that you were good yeah i think it was probably in high school like early late teens early adulthood where i really started to think okay maybe i have something here yeah um, but I was surrounded by so much talent and so many amazing people that it was easy to feel like I couldn't keep up, you know? Yeah. And with all the support you had early on, were you comfortable then when you gradually started writing songs? Did you show it to people? You know, were you open about that? Or is music kind of a private thing? How did you grapple with that? 
you know, songwriting was actually the place where I felt most confident because like I said, I was, you know, born and raised in Los Angeles. I had so many friends who were singers and I never felt like I kept, could keep up with them. And I didn't have the training that they had as early as them. And I didn't have famous parents or whatever, but songwriting, I was the only one who did it. So that was really my place to shine, I felt like. And fortunately for me, my parents were really encouraging and they put summer camps and stuff where songwriting was a thing. And I was considered, you know, special because I could do that. So, you know, it started really just as me talking about my feelings and like the very classic thing of just like I had all these feelings and all these things I wanted to talk about. And so I put them into songs. It just was the most natural thing ever. And then as I started to get older, I learned about, you know, how to write songs and the, the form behind it and the, the science behind songwriting. And as an artist, do you see writing songs as one of the hardest things or is it performing in front of people? Did you gradually have to like train yourself to get better at that? Or how did you transition into, you know, being open in front of people and singing? That's an interesting question. I think, I think songwriting, I felt a little more confident in originally, but now I think being on stage is like my home. It's just my happy place. I feel so confident and I just feel like the best version of myself on stage, but that definitely took a while to get to that point. Um, so I actually went to college for music and I was in this program at USC called the pop music program. And part of my schooling was performing in front of my peers every single week. And this was a group of people that, again, I thought was better than me. So I was really intimidated every single week when I would get up on stage. But when you do it enough and you just start performing in front of the people that you're most intimidated by, you start to become really comfortable. So for me, it went from a thing that I found really scary to a thing that I found very cathartic. And now it's like if I go a couple days without singing and, you know, the pandemic has been really challenging for that because without performing, for me, I just feel so like empty, like that is my happy place, you know? And a lot of people, artists or even creatives, when they want to go into this type of field, they Mm -hmm. kind of have a moment early on where they have to decide school or do I really pursue this? For you, you kind of had a bit of both and it kind of helped in both ways. Talk to me about how important education has been for you because it clearly seems like it's been really valuable and a lot of artists usually have to decide which they have to do. Yeah, I think the fact that I wasn't raised by parents who um, were in entertainment, like education for them was everything. And starting from when I was a little girl, like my parents always told me how smart I was. And school was always a really big part of the conversation for me, which I'm grateful for because I know particularly women, like not a lot of women are valued for being smart and their parents aren't telling them how smart they are all the time. And they don't necessarily have the opportunity to go to college or get a really amazing education. So I feel lucky in that sense. And for me, being in college and going to school, more than even developing myself as an artist, that was just a really important time for me to develop as a human. That was the time that I was kind of going through the things in my life that have really shaped me. So I'm grateful that I had that time to make my mistakes and figure out who I want to be and kind of stumble through you know, those late teen, early adult years, um, because I was a little bit of a lost puppy. So I needed that time to really grow and develop in terms of being an artist. Like, I don't think you can teach somebody how to be an artist. Yeah. And I, I always say this, like, I don't think you can tell somebody what their message should be or how to get that message across to people. You know, you can teach them the fundamentals of music. You know, I was lucky enough that I got to learn music theory and I got to learn how to play the piano. And like I said, I got to practice performing all the time, but I think to figure out what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it, that was work that I had to do on my own. For sure. And, um, when you first released your first song, you know, it had this mm-hmm. immediate success. Did that feel like a relief, I guess, in terms of like, I'm doing all this work, I'm doing all the school, and the first song just works, you know, it features on the stars and things like that. How was that for you, that moment? That was very confusing, to be completely honest with you, because okay. I didn't have any sort of expectation because it was my first song. So like when I put that song out on SoundCloud, Addicted, um, I didn't even put it on, I didn't know about Spotify. I didn't know about any of those. I didn't know how to actually distribute a song. I didn't have, like, I didn't have anything. And so when it started doing well, I didn't really know that it was doing well. You know what I mean? It was a bit confusing. And then it set up these kind of weird expectations for me after that, because I was like, 
well, that's how it goes, right? Like I put out a song and everybody loves yeah. it, which of course is not really how it works, you yeah. know? And so um, it definitely threw me for a bit of a loop, but I'm really grateful that it happened because that's why a lot of people found me, you know, was through this song Addicted. And so I've made a lot of like friendships with people online and I've developed, you know, some fans because of that song. And so I'm glad that it, it worked out the way that it did. <laughs> yeah. And going to what we started the conversation with Loud Luxury and that song doing so well and you know you seeing you know Billboard and things like that how does that now relate to the addicted success now is it kind of like it feels good I guess and I feel like I earned it <laughs> back then it was like what how did this happen like where yeah. did this come from you know what I mean now I feel like I put in the work and the timing of the Loud Luxury song and the success that it's had has been just so amazing for me because that song was actually written like years ago, like two or three years ago. Yeah. And it was supposed to come out two or three years ago, but they started having more success and the their label didn't want to put out two songs at the same time that they were trying to push to radio and everything, which obviously I understood, yeah. but um, it was, it took a lot of patience for me to be, I didn't even know if it would come out in the end, you know, yeah. but it was sort of one of those moments of the universe really just working in my favor because now that the song has come out and it's done quite well and I've gotten to know their fans and kind of gotten a little bit of success with them, I really feel ready to launch my artist project because back when Addicted came out, like I was really just exploring. I was just trying things and yeah. seeing what worked. And I hadn't done all of this developmental work that I've done now, whereas now I feel like I have this thing that I want to say and I know how I want to say it so I'm grateful that I have a little bit more of a platform than I did even if months ago before that song yeah and that takes us to Lola yeah and, the, <laughs> and uh talk about that what it represents you know in the video and things like that and like you said building upon yourself with you know mm -hmm. the potential of an upcoming EP how does this all feel now it sounds like you feel like you're in the right spot to do all this. I I really I really do that's um which is such an amazing thing to feel because it hasn't always been that way, but I feel like I'm exactly where I'm meant to be and I'm writing the music that I'm meant to be writing and it's reaching the people that it's meant to reach. So I feel very grateful for, grateful for all of that. Um, so Lola is the first song of my EP, which will be out in 2021. That feels so like we're in the yeah. future. 2021. <laughs> That's so crazy. Well, 2020 ever ends. <laughs> <laughs> I know, crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the EP will be out eventually. Lola is the first song on the EP. I wrote it completely by myself. And it was one of those songs that just kind of fell out of me, which ironically addicted was too. Like, there are these songs that kind of I just write them and then I go back and I'm like, what did I, what was, what was my brain trying yeah. to tell the rest of me, you know? And it's really about. So Lola doesn't actually exist. In the story, she is this girl that my boyfriend cheats on me with, and she kind of represents everything that I'm not. And she's super confident. She's like this femme fatale vixen. And in the story, I'm this naive, innocent, hopeless romantic who just thinks that like life will always be perfect, you know? Yeah. And that's who I kind of used to be. And so Lola is about that moment where you realize that like you can't fake a perfect life. Also, why would you want to realistically, yeah. you know what I mean? But it's like that moment where you realize that life is not all fairy tales and white picket fences and happy endings. It's, it's sometimes really tough and really dark and sometimes good people do bad things. And it, that's just how life works. And when I realized that moment for me, it came in the form of a, a really abusive relationship that ended really badly yeah. and I was in love with this person and so I thought okay I love this person I'll end up with this person right like that's how it works but I quickly learned that love is not necessarily enough to make something work and it was like the pillars of everything that I believed came crumbling down you know it was just the most heartbreaking eye-opening thing that I ever went through and so I wrote this song a few years after that happened but it was like my way of processing that and acknowledging that it's really painful. And at first I wanted to hold on to that picture perfect life that I had envisioned for myself. But at the end of the day, that's not productive and that doesn't help me at all. And once I was able to go through that experience and come out the other side, like I finally found who I was. So in the, in the story, you know, Lola's this dramatic character, but in real life, she's like this metaphor for the moment that I started to become who I am now. Yeah. And I think the rest of the EP kind of follows that same trajectory. And it's like about my journey over the last couple of years, becoming 
who I am today and like becoming a bad bitch. Yeah. And with all that, <laughs> so myself. <laughs> and with all that, as an artist, you know, going back to, you know, karaoke with Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, things like that, how is it okay. going to feel for you to have your own project out in the world? It's kind of your giving it the sound like your introduction. How is that going to feel? Does it feel like a, you know, accumulation of everything you've done to this point? You know, how, how is that going to feel for you when it's officially out? You know, I think it's very nerve wracking, but it's sort of like putting your soul on display for the world and being like, okay, judge me, you know? Yeah. But I really truly feel like this music is the most me thing I could have made. And so if I'm going to go out with something, I'm really proud that it's this. Um, it's definitely intimidating and I hope that people like it. You know, I'm not bulletproof. Like I want people to like what I do. But at the end of the day, I really can go into it saying, like, I put my all into this project and it is who I am. And it is my journey over the last couple of years. And, like, I'm al already thinking about what's after this EP because that's just sort of how my brain works. But I'm excited. You know, I've worked so long to be able to put out a project. And I've put out singles and I've gotten to collaborate with amazing people. But to be able to put my name on something that is so me through and through, I'm just so excited. And on the note of, I was going to bring that up because I've had this conversation with so many artists. Cause I always want to ask when you have these big moments, whether it's, you know, it's billboard and whether it's all these streams, things like that. And with this for you, you know, you're releasing your first project and things like that. You've already talked about, you know, I already know what's going to come next or I'm already looking forward to that. How do you as an artist allow yourself to just kind of look back and appreciate or just be like, I've done a lot, you know, I can take a moment and I've, you know, appreciate the work, I guess, you know, because mm -hmm. for you, this is going to be like a really big moment, but you're already saying what's next, you know? <laughs> so I, I always ask like these artists, like, don't you just have a moment to like say, hey, this is like, because it's really hard to grapple with, I'd imagine. That's the hardest things for me is to like celebrate the wins and be in the moment. I feel like I'm always in this place of like thinking about the future and what's next and how I can beat the last thing that I did and where I want to end up because, you know, I'm making these leaps in my career, but I'm still so far from where I want to be. Like, I want to be able to touch as many people as humanly possible and connect with as many people as humanly possible. And that still feels so far away, you know? So for me to live in the present moment and be able to celebrate these moments is really hard but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, you know, seeing my name in billboard with the loud luxury guys for that song, that was a moment that I was like, Whoa, that's so cool. Like, that's amazing. But then also I was like, I want it to be just my name. I love them, but I also just want it to be my name at one point, you know, um, signing my record deal. Like that was a big moment for me. I'm trying to really celebrate the wins and celebrate these moments while still balancing my ambition and my drive for what's next, you know what I mean? So it's, you know what's actually really helpful? Sorry, I just thought about this. What's really helpful is talking with my fans on Instagram because some of them have been following me for a couple years now. Yeah. And so they really remind me like, look how far you've come. And when they're really proud of me, it makes me feel so much more proud of myself. Yeah, cause so it's, helpful. it's like uh, the best feeling, you know, that's when you have like the real fan stuff, you know, cause when you're a real fan of an artist, when they have their like moment, it feels mm -hmm. like it's your moment as well. And that's how you grow a fan base because your, it is. your like, win is I, their win. That's what I always tell them. I always tell them like anything that I'm doing is because of them. If they didn't care about what I was doing and like, it's so cool to watch. It sounds weird to even say like fans, they're like my friends, you know, we talk all the time, but to watch that grow and to watch the community grow has just been so exciting. But the ones who have been there from the beginning, like it is as much their win as it is my win. And I try to remind them of all the time because I'm nothing without them. If they don't care about my music, like nothing happens, you know? So yeah. it's been cool. It's definitely hard to, to celebrate the wins, but I'm trying. <laughs> now, usually when I get near the end of my interviews and this has been a common theme since March, I think that's when our lockdowns really started in Toronto yeah. without the possibility of having tour dates and shows and things like that. I usually ask like what's next, but because of COVID that question is kind of out of the window at the end. <laughs> so for you, you know, on the journey you've been on throughout your career, what's been the one thing that has kind of helped you along so far? 
whether it's, I guess, talking to fans or talking to your family, what's the one thing that's kept you pushing forward? That's a good question because it really is, it's hard. It's really tough and it takes its toll on your mental state and your self-confidence and you have to kind of build a fortress around yourself in order to stay in it. And fortunately for me, I, I learned that at a really young age being from here, but it's, it can be really tough. And for me, I think what's helped me stay in it, definitely the fans, definitely communicating with them and seeing how proud they are of me. But also just to be honest, like this probably sounds cheesy as fuck, but I feel like it's bigger than me. Yeah. I, you know, like I was put on this planet to do something. I was given this voice. I was, you know, given this passion for writing songs and for performing them and for connecting with people. And it sort of feels like it's not mine to say no to. Yeah. You know, I remember one time I was talking to a friend of mine who was going, you know, right after college to work at an agency and he loved music as much as I did. And I remember saying to him, like, maybe I should just do what you're doing. Like, maybe that would make me happy and I could be around music, but not have to like do this. Like it's so hard. And he was like, Morgan, you don't get to do that. He was like, if I had a voice and if I could write songs the way that you do, and if I could connect with people the way that you do, I would do that. But that's not, that's not what I was given. And so it just kind of feels like it's bigger than me and it's not my decision whether or not I get to do it or not. Like it's just, it feels like I was put on this earth to connect with people and to inspire people and hopefully make them feel a little bit more self-love and a little bit more confidence. And so I'm never going to say no to that, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, it sort of takes the pressure off a little bit too, because, um, yeah, it just feels like a little bit more distance outside of me. I think the best feeling in the world is when you realize what you're doing is what you're meant to be doing. And then yeah. everything kind of washes away because you're just like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So even if it's stressful and it's exhausting, mm-hmm. I'm meant to do this. So I, I totally I understand. I'm so lucky to even have that thing. Exactly. You know, I know a lot of people spend a lot of years searching for that thing that lights them up in a way that like they can't even put into words. And I found that when I was nine years old. So yeah. again, it's like, who am I to tell the universe? Like, no, I don't want that. Like, I just feel so lucky that I have this thing that just, like, sets my whole world on fire. Exactly. And honestly, amazing conversation. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it could have lasted uh, forever. But again, I appreciate you taking the time to be on Studio One. Oh, my God. One. Thank you for having me. Can't wait to see the f- project, listen to that. Uh, yeah. Early congratulations on that. I know it's going to be a big moment. Um, hopefully this year finally does end. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my> God, hopefully <laughs> counting down the days <laughs> and then we can get to 2021 yeah and then hopefully eventually we can meet in person maybe exactly. on tour or something show in toronto yes that would yes. be amazing oh can't wait for that day all right again thank you so much thank you so much for having me bye bye studio one